So now um, I have my pleasure to introduce Christopher Weichel. Uh, Christopher is a Curator's Distinguished Professor and Chair of Statistics of the University of Missouri. And he received his PhD in Statistics and Atmospheric Science from Iowa State University in 1996. Uh, he was previously a Research Fellow at NCAR uh, from 1996 to 1998 before going to the University of Missouri. And he received uh, many prestigious awards. Uh, he is, uh, one of the awards is uh, related to his book, uh, co-authored with Professor Noel Cressy in the area of spatial temporal statistics. And um, well, just, uh, I just don't want to say more about, about him, but he's going to talk about using deep models for, from machine learning for parsimonious and efficient implementation of multi-scale multi spatial temporal statistical models. A long title, but I'm, I'm sure you'll enjoy his talk. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Elise. Um, thanks to the organizers. Um, as uh, John Stroud just mentioned, my title is not very parsimonious. Um, and so <laughs> that's OK. Um, so uh, before I started, let me just give you a little bit of um, first thank you for coming and, and you know, before your, your trips today. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, as Doug Nishka mentioned in his talk the other day, there, there are many people in the audience who, who should or could be giving this lecture, and so it's, it's quite an honor to be able to do that. Um, the topic is something that um, I'm not really an expert in deep learning, um, not from the machine learning side, but what happened was a couple years ago, since I've been kind of doing deep modeling and statistics, which I'll define, I'll give you my definition in a little bit, um, I kind of wanted to learn what was going on with the machine learning aspects of deep learning. So I taught a class, and my students and I programmed all the, the, the new methods up from scratch, and I learned a lot, and, and kind of became a quasi-convert um, in, in the sense that I wanted to see how I could use some of that stuff um, in my own work. And so my student, Patrick McDermott, who defended last Friday, um, took, the, took this on and decided to, to pursue some of these things. Um, so first, um, uh, Jay Stewart Hunter, um, pioneer in applied statistics, industrial statistics, design. Um, so it's kind of weird for me because I don't really do a lot of that. But then I noticed that he gave this um, interview in 2016, and, and I just thought it was, it was really perfect for ties in this meeting. If you look at the talks, if you look at the, uh, what he said was the greatest challenges in the profession, uh, so much of that is the stuff that we, we're, we're doing, and, and it sort of does relate to my talk. So, so I was felt comforted by that. So, so here's basically my talk. So if, if you decide that you need some coffee, um, this is it. Uh, basically, um, modeling space-time stuff in, in a complex situation, there's all sorts of interactions that are going on. Um, and to, to accommodate that, um, you can build parametric statistical models. Um, I spent a long time trying to do that. Um, or you can fit machine learning models. Um, but the challenge there is, is sort of making these things work in the high dimensions and complex environments that we see. And, and so many of the great talks I've seen so far here at TIES have been related to that topic. Um, fusing data in complex environments, doing dimension reduction, on stationarity, et cetera. Um, so that's hard and, and, and sort of job security. but. But are there other things that we can do? And so that's what I want to talk to you about, um, give you kind of a, a tutorial on, on some methods that, that might be useful. Um, again, just pretty simple stuff. And basically, at the end of the day, I'm going to talk about these um, echo state network models. And, and how we can use those is basically something that we, we know how to do, is, which is just high dimensional regression. Okay. So that's, that's the gist of it. Um, so, often I show this as an animation, but I didn't know if it would work. If it were animated, you would see the sea surface temperature on the upper left, uh, the clouds in the upper right, and then soil moisture down on the bottom. So all moving at different scales of time and space. And, and so, obviously there's a relationship between the ocean and the atmosphere, as I'll talk about in a bit. And then how that might affect things like um, soil moisture, which is something that I'll talk about in this talk as well. So the point is, interactions, potentially nonlinear across a lot of different processes. So what I really want to focus on in terms of an application day is long lead forecasting. 
And for those of you who don't know what that is, most of you I'm sure do, but um, it's just a notion of forecasting some meteorological or climatological or um, response variable that's related to those things on sort of monthly to, to seasonal to yearly timescales. And so you might say, well, how is that even possible because, because of, of, of chaos, right? So if, you know, if I start two points here in the, in the Lorenz system, and, and, and follow them along, eventually they're gonna diverge because of the sensitivity to initial conditions. And so that's why we can't forecast the weather you know, beyond 10 to 14 days. So how can we do long lead forecasting? Well, the answer is because the ocean works on a different time scale than the atmosphere, right? And they're, they're coupled. So if you can say something about the ocean, then perhaps you can say something about the atmosphere and, and its response. So in particular, um, Think about the El Nino. I should focus on, on one set of maps here. So um, El Nino, La Nina, you know, warming and cooling of the tropical Pacific is going to do what? Well, it's going to change the convective clusters that are present in the, in the tropical um, ocean. And, and because of that, the heat content changes, and that changes the, the wave structure in the, in the um, troposphere. And so you get this, the jet stream changing its position depending on which of those modes you're in. And when that happens, it changes the weather, right? When it changes the weather, it changes the potential impacts, depending on, on where you are. So things like precipitation centers are going to likely shift, not necessarily, but, but there's a propensity for the, towards that. And then that might affect things like soil moisture um, over the corn producing regions of the US. Okay. So the key to this is, is the sea surface temperature. The key to long lead forecasting over, the, over North America is sea surface temperature. So how do we do that? Well, there's, there's really two approaches. Deterministic models can be run to do long lead forecasting, or this is one of the few places in, in forecasting in meteorological contexts where statistical models actually often outperform deterministic models. Um, and so, and, or you can do hybrid models as well. Uh, most of these models um, are going to somehow or another ref reflect the fact that the process is nonlinear, not all, some linear models do, do quite well, but in general, at least the deterministic and the complex stat models are gonna reflect that nonlinearity. Okay, so there's two primary ways to do long lead forecasting. The simplest, well not necessarily the simplest, but the first way is to say, I've got sea surface temperature, and then I'm gonna forecast it forward, say six months into the future, somehow, with a dynamical model. And we've seen plenty of examples of that in this conference. And then I'm gonna do some sort of, say, regression relationship contemporaneously between sea surface temperature and some response, like soil moisture. Okay, so it's kind of a two-step process. The other alternative is to um, go directly from the sea surface temperature, in this case, to the response. So it sort of skips that intermediate stage. So, so instead of saying, oh, I'm gonna forecast the sea surface temperature first, dynamically, and then the response, I'm just gonna forecast dynamically from from sea surface temperature to this response. And that's nothing more than a, than a space-time regression, right? So one field is regressed onto another field, and I'm gonna use historical trajectories of, say, sea surface temperature to help me do that. And so I'll kind of focus on this approach in this talk, although a little bit of the other one. Okay. So um, fortunately in this audience, you know, most of you, um, from what I've seen in the talk so far, uh, do this all the time, but there's, there's sort of, uh, a general way to think about space-time modeling, um, and, and that is uh, we usually have an observation equation and we condition the latent process of interest on that. Um, you know, you, choice of that distribution depends on your pro problem of interest. And then we're gonna focus on this latent process, which is usually con consists of some sort of fixed effects, and then this random process, this dependent random process. And, and so this is where all the, all the research is, essentially. Well, that's not true. I guess. I guess we're interested in all, all aspects of that problem, but, but most of the stuff we hear about here is either thinking about how we combine data up in the first stage and then how we might model stuff down here in the second stage. So the, the big challenge there and the kind of problems I'm interested in is how do you get that complexity into that, to, to that um, random process? And particularly in this context where you've got multiple scales of behavior, ocean working on a different time scale than the thing you're trying to predict. So this is where we get to deep models. So deep models are the way to build complexity. That's, that's just what it is. And so, so this is my own sort of brief view of this, and then I'll go into some of the, 
the nuances of the way how we would do this in statistics versus um, machine learning and then kind of combine those together. But the idea is we're just linking a bunch of models together or telescoping them together to get to an output. And the key to that is, is that we're sort of building complexity through that process. You know, either we're learning stuff or we're, we're just accounting for variability at different scales. Okay. And so it's not, you know, we don't call it deep modeling in statistics, at least we didn't used to, but, but it's certainly something we've been doing. And you know I have to give this slide if you know me. Um, but, but, but this is deep modeling. Well, Mark Berliner's philosophy about environmental complex modeling was very much a deep modeling paradigm that, that you don't just stop at that process level, you keep going. And each of those levels has ulti um, potential other levels that connect as well, all probabilistically. Okay. And as Noel Cressy likes to say, they don't need to be Bayesian, but, but typically they are if they become very deep. Okay. So an example of that, um, well, before I get there, um, one of the things that, that makes sort of a Berliner deep model different than other kinds of hierarchical models is, is a firm belief that second order modeling should be avoided as much as possible. You know, we spend a lot of time working on covariance models in space time and spatial statistics because that's sort of how we were brought up. But, but Mark's philosophy was, we'll get that through marginalization, right? So it's, it's hard to model dependent structures, particularly in, in real world processes where we really have no idea what that, that dependent structure is. And so just keep pushing it down into a hierarchical. The deeper you go, the less you have to focus on how to build second order structure. So it's kind of a, a nice idea. It's often not done that way for various reasons, um, but that was his, that was his notion. And, and so, so those deep models are just linked conditional models, right? Um, and, and so the, the beauty of them is it models complexity. You can put inputs at different stages, but very much a top-down model, right? Your data's at the top. Your inputs are probably at the top, too. And then you start modeling structure, pushing things down in the conditional mean, and, 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 and eventually you stop, right? Eventually you either put a non-informative prior on something or, or, or I don't know. You got to stop at some point. Um, so here's an example. Oops, um, just sort of a canonical dynamical model for space-time dynamical stuff. Um, and, and so you'd have your data model here conditioned on the true process. The key to that is you're almost always going to assume some sort of conditional independence, right? That's your simplicity. You get that, it's going to help. The, the next stage is some sort of a transformation like a link function. You have a, a mean that could depend on some different inputs. And then um, some a random process, a space-time random process. Often in the complex dynamical settings, we're going to do a dimension reduction there. And so these, this V is a basis set. Alpha then is a lower dimensional process, which isn't such a bad thing in, in dynamics because most complex dynamics actually do reside on a lower dimensional manifold. And then you can, the variability left over can be accommodated by this residual process. And the key to that is that residual process is probably going to be pretty simple. It better be if you're going to do this. Um, and then you, you, the focus is on trying to come up with realistic dynamical models, which that's really where the challenge is, as I'll mention in a second. And then you can keep going, right? Your parameters could have dependence on them, et cetera. And, and you know, it could get kind of crazy. OK, so, so the challenge there statistically in a parametric model or even a, a non-parametric st statistical model is this dynamical process. And, and the challenge there is that you have to have interactions. You can't model complex dynamics in space-time without interaction. You know? And, and, and I, can, I can show you why that is. Um, that's not the point of this talk. But, but it, you have to. You can't, you can't just assume things are sort of independently evolving. Because what makes it dynamically interesting is the fact that, that things are interacting, either across space and time or across scale and time. And so in a nonlinear situation, then, then the cursive dimensionality of the parameter space gets crazy. Right? And you've got to do something about it. You've either got to put some science information in there, some, a lot of data to, to learn. Um, you've got to regularize, et cetera. So that's what makes those deep models. And it also is what makes it computationally difficult and why it takes postdocs you know, two years to fit one of these things. Right? So, so I'm, I'm kind of tired of that. 
I, I love these models, but, but I don't like to wait two years to fit one anymore. So, so what would a machine learner do? So a machine learner would say, well, we've got deep models, okay? And, and again, those of you who actually know this stuff, keep in mind, I'm not an expert, but this is my perspective. So like the, the traditional neural network models uh, are going to, um, to, to kind of accomplish the same thing. These are much, very much bottom-up models, so your inputs are going to, to connect to a hidden layer through some weights, parameters or weights are the same thing. And then typically there's sort of a reduction stage, so you connect that hidden la layer to another stage, like some sort of dimension reduction, pooling, et cetera. And then that just keeps going, so you link these things together, and eventually you take that last stage and then it maps into your output space, okay? Um, and, and, and most of these functions that go between these things are nonlinear. Okay, they don't have to be, but most of them are. So again, bottom up, and when you fit these, um, if you ever do this from scratch, you'll realize it takes a lot of data. When it works, it works really well, but you've got to have a boatload of data. Uh, you've got to have a really good computational background, or at least a, a high-performance computing environment to make it work. Um, you've got to start using either other information or um, somehow or another impart, you know, training, often pre-training or some sort of prior knowledge into these things. Um, and you have to regularize a lot, okay? So you can see some similarities between what we do in statistics and what happens here. The downside of this, other than the computational part and the fact that you need a, a boatload of data, is that um, you don't get a whole lot of ability to do inference and you don't get a whole lot of ability to do um, uncertainty quantification. So both of the things that, that hurt us in statistics. And you may or may not get reproducibility. Um, and this is one of the things, some people call this stability now. I, I think Ben Yu calls that stability. I don't like to use that word because that means something different in dynamical systems. But, but the idea is you want to be able to get reproducibility in these models. So here's the, the classical example of a, of a convolutional neural network. Um, which is one of the things that revolutionized this, this whole business. And so you, you would take an image and then you, you, you basically take, a, uh, you, con you convolve a, a little weight matrix, which you estimate those weights um, across the image. And then that convolution gets um, pushed forward. And you do that multiple times. So you get different, different convolutional weight matrices and you run that over each one. And then you take that and then you, you somehow or another reduce that space. And so you could pool, you could average those, that block together, or you could take the highest value or the smallest value. There's all sorts of ways to do the dimension reduction there. And then you do it again, then you convolve that. And so the, the, the beauty of that is, is you're, you're basically learning, each one of these levels, you're learning features in that, in that image, okay? So it's sort of a slow way to find important image pieces of an image that end up, at the end of the day, getting connected back to your output, okay? So that's how it works. Um, I mean, really naively, but that's kind of how it works. Um, so the key idea is there, it's an alternating this um, uh, kind of averaging, convolving stage with this dimension reduction stage over and over, linking these together, having pretty small groups of, of hidden, numbers of hidden units because um, because you have enough deep layers to learn it. So, so you don't need, like the traditional neural network had, had really wide levels um, and, and uh, you know, tended to overfit. This doesn't tend to overfit because each one of these things is sort of just a small feature that, that you use. And so it um, makes it a, a much slower learning process. So here's a, a long list of sort of the similarities between these things. Multiple connected levels, uh, dimension reduction stages, None of these models that I just talked about, the, the, these classical deep models, model second order dependence. They're all sort of working on a conditional mean structure. Uh, multiple inputs, uh, lots of data, some sort of prior knowledge, um, computational complexity, et cetera. And so what we started doing was saying, you know, we, we fit these models and, and some of them work okay for space-time data. Um, but they're, they're just as expensive and complicated as fitting the stat model, so without some of the benefits. So we thought, well, what can we do? Well, I want to get to a par uh, parsimonious framework, but to start, I'm going to talk about what would you do to get time dependence 
in these models. And so that's this notion of a recurrent neural network. And a recurrent neural network just means somehow I'm going to build memory into this system um, so, so I kind of know what's happened in the past. And not necessarily um, Markovian, because uh, if you think about it, like a lot of the application of this are things like speech recognition and natural language processing. And so, for example, if, if you were scanning through text and you had seen the word Mexico, right, and then, you know, four or five sentences later, somebody was going to say something about a language, oh, I need to learn how to speak, then, then you would know that it would be likely the, the, the word would be Spanish, right? So you would have remembered not what happened in the last sentence or the last word, but five sentences ago. Right? That's the beauty of these models, is that it's sort of non-Markovian way to get um, time dependence uh, into the structure. Okay? So these models have become huge. I mean, you're using them when, on your phone, on your smartphone, um, all the time. You know, you're searching the web, you're using a convolutional neural network sometimes, but you're almost always using a recurrent neural network. Um, you just don't know it. So this is the simplest possible version of one of those models. And the idea is you've got an output stage. Um, and so you get these hidden units. And you have some weights. That's what that V matrix is. Um, and then some function, some activation function. And then the, the, the important part is this hidden stage. And notice. It looks like an autoregressive model with a nonlinear transformation, and then the input gets put in. So, so at each stage, you're sort of taking a weighted combination of the past values of this hidden process and, and whatever your input is. And the input's crucial here, absolutely crucial. The other thing that's crucial is that um, the, the, the structure, not the form of that activation function, but typically some sort of nonlinear transformation. Like, pick your favorite one. You know, it depends on your process, but some sort of sigmoidal function usually, or a relu function, or something like that. Um, the difficulty of this is why nobody uses these models is because um, there's a, a a ton of parameters here, and, and they're not really identifiable. So, so to make this work, um, you've got to do some trickery with. You can't use the standard optimization algorithms. You've got to do some trickery. And, and people sort of got tired of that, so they, they, they use some, some different, more complicated ones called long, long short-term memory ones. But, but the idea is still the same, okay? You need a lot of data. Um, you have to go through that same process that I mentioned that we do in, in deep models in general, although this is not a deep model, okay? And these models have been around for a long time. Okay, so, so what's a parsimonious alternative to that? And when I say parsimonious in this case, I don't mean that we're going to have fewer parameters. I just mean that we have to estimate fewer parameters, okay, which is crucial. I want to get away from this, this thought that I have to do this massive optimization. And so it turns out, and, and some of you may know this, I didn't, um, there's this literature starting back in the, maybe 20 years ago uh, about reservoir computing, which I'd never even heard that terminology before. And the three main types of reservoir computing are what are called echo state networks, liquid state networks, and then extreme learning machines. And they all kind of work with the same principle. And so let me talk about that. So this looks a lot like that standard recurrent neural network I, I presented before. The difference is crucial. This part isn't such a big difference. This is just a standardization, which I'll talk about in a second. What makes this model so much different is that we do not estimate the, the parameters W and the parameters U those weights that correspond to this hidden evolution process. So all these things in the middle here, this is called the reservoir, are just randomly selected. You don't estimate them, you just randomly select them. They're the most important part of the model, but you don't estimate them. What you do estimate, then, are the, are the output parameters. So imagine that this G1 is just the identity function, that's just a regression. So we'll do some sort of regularized regression on that, usually a, a ridge regression, but you could pick your favorite regularization for that. And, and so it's kind of re remarkable. Um, these parameters here are just there. Um, this is the largest eigenvalue of W. Remember, we didn't estimate W, so we randomly select that from some, I'll kind of give you a distribution here in a second. And so we have to sort of standardize that so it doesn't blow up. All right, so that's the largest eigenvalue, you scale it, and then you can kind of control the rate of learning with this other parameter. So instead of having, you know, I don't know, nh squared, et cetera, parameters here, we basically have one to estimate, to worry about. And then we can just do a regression, or 
classification problem. So, um, so Patrick and I thought, well, first of all, I just didn't believe these things worked. And so, so Patrick, I said, you know, check it out, see what you can do. And, and do it on a space-time problem, which most people hadn't done. I don't know if anybody had done that, really. Um, and so one of the things that was important when we did it in space-time is we had to use a, we used a quadratic term in the output state. It, you don't have to have that, but it usually works better. Um, okay, so that's still just a regression. Um, the other thing that we did is we, we um, augmented the input space um, by what are called embeddings, which is just using lag values of the inputs, which is anybody who's done dynamical systems, you know about embeddings through Tocken's theorem, et cetera. So you can re recover the higher dimensional state process if you have enough lags of, of a smaller dimensional part of that process. Um, so those things help, and we just added noise onto uh, a noise term. Uh, so this model could be fit like in five seconds on my computer in a high dimensional problem that would take hours on like an MCMC. Okay. And, and so here are the parameters that you draw from those, from the reservoir. Uh, just some, uh, this is, you could, you could do other things, but, but basically just um, from a uniform, so, uh, a mixture of a uniform with, with very small values and then a Dirac at, at zero. So basically it's sparse. Most of those parameters are zero, okay, and the ones that aren't zero are small. And, and you can choose the number there and there's some, some advice on doing that. It's not very sensitive to to, to that part of the thing. It is sensitive to the number of hidden units, how you do the ridge regression, and, and how you do the, the time scaling. But you can, there's only three parameters, right? So we can, we can get that. Uh, so, so to start with, we thought, well, it, it doesn't make sense to just pick one set of parameters, right? Because you'll get an answer. And you know, in, in the engineering world, they will pick, they'll make that hidden state very wide and, and get a pretty good reproducibility. But we wanted to do some more slower learning, so we, did, we made the number of hidden states smaller, and then we decided to do like a parametric bootstrap approach, or, and so, or an ensemble approach, where we simply sample these things, those weights, generate the hidden units, and, and get an estimate, and then just do that over and over again. It's the most naive thing you could do, right? You could, you could program this in 10 minutes in R, right? It's just totally, totally trivial. Um, and, and there is some precedence for it, and, and surprisingly, it actually works really well. Um, so we did this on the forecasting Pacific sea surface temperature um, six months into the future. And this was the last ENSO cycle, which was pretty hard to forecast. If you look back historically, most of the stat models didn't do very well on this. Um, so this is all out of sample prediction. And, and as these kinds of forecasts go, this is actually pretty good. Um, so this is a, the mean of this field. This is the, the uncertainty quantification, pixel-wise. And for, for the El Nino and the La Nina. So this is, this is sort of showing you out of sample summaries of the uh, Nino 3.4 region, a region of, of high activity in the Pacific. And, and, and the truth is, so, so all of these, all stat models I've ever seen in this context fail to get the initial intensity as, as high as it it should have been. But that's, that's pretty standard. It's because SST isn't the only thing that's governing this process, okay? Um, but still, um, as these things go, we were sort of shocked that the uncertainty quantification, which is extremely ad hoc here, actually works pretty well, okay? All out of sample here. And so, um, some of you may have been unfortunate enough to see my JSM talk last year when I was presenting this, and, and at the time, um, I didn't present this slide, but I had done this. So I had produced a forecast from the data we had at the time, which was in June. Um, and, and I got, this was what was done in, in the Climate Prediction Center, and that's available every month. And, and our, our prediction was here. And I thought, oh, okay, really this doesn't work, probably. But it was just lucky. Um, so I didn't present that. I just said, yeah, you know, you could do this in real time if you wanted to. And then it turns out that um, the truth was right here, right? So, so out of all those models, this model, which is by far the simplest in terms of how fast it was to implement, turned out to be the one that worked, okay? That could still be a coincidence, by the way, but sort of shocking at the time to me. Um, so it kind of made me a bit of a believer um, that maybe there's something to this, 
I, you know, I'm still not 100% convinced. Um, so, so why did this kind of work? Well, um, you know, it's sort of the same reason why a lot of these machine learning methods work. You know, this is sort of an, an ensemble of a bunch of weak learners that we're averaging together. And, 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 you know, so the committee of weak learners approach has been shown over and over again to work in these you know, in prediction settings. And, and I think that's kind of why it's working. I have some other ideas and, and thoughts that I'll, I could talk to you about. But the main thing here is that, you know, it doesn't overfit, typically, because all of those things that you're learning, you know, have, there's not very many parameters or weights that are non-zero, and then there's a lot of them overall that you're looking at. So, so it, the chances of overfitting are, are pretty low. So we did do a fully Bayesian version of this model. Of course, I'm going to do that because that's kind of what I do. Um, and it was hard, hard to make that computation work because those parameters are not identifiable. You've got to do all sorts of transformations and stuff to make it work. Um, so it's hard to do. It takes a long time. You get a slight benefit, slight, in terms of the predictive ability. You do get a benefit in terms of the uncertainty quantification just a little bit, but it's, really, it's just not worth it. It's just, it's just not worth it. Um, that model, though, is not really the best model to solve the problem that I talked about before, this long lead forecasting problem. And why is that? Because it doesn't really accommodate multiple scales in time. Right? And that's what I want to do. So, so that's why I need a deep model. And there are people who've done deep models in recurrent neural networks, for sure, and even in echo state networks, but not in a space-time context and not in a, play, or a way that can accommodate uncertainty quantification. And so we thought, well, what would be the most naive thing that we could do? And, and, it's, and it's essentially um, this notion of, of what is the deep model really doing? It's taking input and it's transforming it, right? So we're transforming this input stochastically and also dynamically, it turns out. And we do that multiple times, and those are potential inputs, and then, then we're doing a space-time regression, right? We just, so we're gonna regularize which ones of those things we, we choose, and, and so um, we know how to do that. We know how to do high-dimensional regression, and then all we're really doing otherwise is just taking transformations of inputs and using those as potential predictors. So that's how we wanna do it, and so we did that, and we did it in a, in a uh, bootstrap and a Bayesian approach. I'm going to talk about the Bayesian approach here because it, it looks more complicated. Um, so the, f the first stage here is just a, the usual dimension reduction stage that we do. And, you know, this is, these are EOFs. Um, you could call them space-time principal components, but, but they're EOFs. Um, uh, and and so lower dimensional space and with some way to deal with the residual structure there, which I'm not going to talk about, but you could do that fairly easily here. Um, and then, then this is just a regression. And, and, and so some transformation of, of input, and I've got a bunch of them. And so at, at some point then, I'm gonna have to regularize the betas, and then I have to choose how, what the transformation I'm gonna do, okay? So here's, here's the details of that. Um, this, is, this is a deep recurrent neural network. And again, it looks way worse than it is. What happens is this is exactly the model I showed you before, down at the, at the lowest stage. So I have my inputs, and then I, I run through this recursion, okay? That then feeds into a dimension reduction stage. Remember how deep models work. Uh, you have this, this hidden state uh, level, and then there's usually some sort of reduction stage. And this reduction stage here, you could pick your favorite reduction method. Uh, again, we've tried nonlinear reduction there. We've tried linear reduction. PCA works as well, or better than almost anything most of the time, um, for us at least. And then that feeds into the next level. So now notice there's no input. The input at this level was just this dimension reduced stage. And then that go, and you keep going until you get to the top. And remember, all of these parameters that correspond to this stuff, um, all the weight matrices, are chosen at random. Uh, I'll show you that distribution here in a second. And the only thing you really have to estimate are the parameters associated with um, these delta parameters that are associated with the sort of speed at which things um, learn, or the, or the time scale of those, be, of those levels, okay? So here's the, the weights are drawn from the same kind of distribution, mixture distribution I talked about before. Um, and, and again, most of this stuff isn't sensitive to that, uh, fortunately. Um, and then, so this is the full model. 
and it looks worse than it is, but in the Bayesian context, this is just a stochastic search variable selection regularization model. So I have my, my regression parameter here. This is my, my measurement model dimension. So what I'm using here as potential predictors is the la all of the last stage inputs, which is typical in deep models. The last stage usually is fully connected. And then all the, tr all the transformations that happen at those middle stages, all those dimension reduction ones or potential covariates. Okay, and then there's, again, this mixture of stochastic search variable selection type prior on the betas. You can pick your favorite prior for that. In fact, this doesn't have to be Bayesian, right? You could easily just do uh, your favorite um, uh, regularized regression on this, so long as you could account for this initial um, data model transformation. Um, like Mandy's model yesterday, if you saw her talk, some version of that would work here just fine, probably just as well or better. Um, so, anyway, this is, this is as easy as it gets, right? Only thing I have to estimate are these parameters effectively, um, and, and these things are really, really efficient. So, uh, just some, some, back, some stuff on, on how you choose the hyperparameters. Uh, we usually fix, again, the ones from the, the weight matrix reservoir stuff because so long as you're, you're in a small range there and, and your parameters are you're likely to be zero, um, it's not super sensitive, and so you can play with it, but it's not going to change much. A uh, number of hidden layers. Uh, we fix those here because we have the dimension reduction stages, so it's, they're not so important either. And the only, these are the important ones um, down here, which have to do with the regularization stuff typically. Um, uh, and, and we do these through uh, a genetic algorithm. So we just have to run the model, this deep model, um, you know, hundreds of times, but they're super fast, so it's not that big a deal. Um, dimension reduction at that stage, again, I, we're just using PCA here, but you could, you could pick your favorite one. We play with Laplacian eigenmaps and that kind of stuff, but it usually doesn't help too much. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you some, some results now of this model, and we're going to look at mean squared error, mean squared prediction error, out of sample always here, um, we like to look at uh, CRPS because that way it gets a sense of, of the distributional properties of, of these things, which are super important if we're doing uncertainty quantification. And well, if you're not familiar with skill scores, most of you probably are, um, it's just a way to look at um, a comparison to some reference. And so in the forecasting context um, of, of soil moisture, soil moisture is a hard thing to predict long lead. And so if you can't do better than, well, often you can't do better in climatology. And so it's a good thing to compare to. Okay, so um, we're going to demonstrate this on, on a model that we, we created. Um, in the applied math world and in meteorology, people have done a connection of a multi-scale Lorenz 96 model. It's, it's a great model. If you're ever going to play with a complex system, I recommend this. So it's two Lorenz 96 models, which are spatial, one-dimensional spatial models on, on, a, on a ring uh, with non quadra um, quadratic nonlinearity here some forcing terms. And so you have two scales, a small scale and a large scale, and, and basically a simple aggregation to get you from one to the other. And then our, we just added on a process stage, or I'm sorry, a data stage to this as well. So it's a three-level model. And so this is the kind of, this is the structure of that. So, so this is your data, this is the large-scale thing, it's related to, this, to these small-scale things. And, and so this is space, but I just, it looks kind of cool to draw it in a circle. So this is a realization of that. Um, this is something like you might expect in flow data. I mean, you can imagine environmental data that might look like that. I mean, I don't know. It's sort of a stretch. Um, maybe precip if it was raining all the time uh, in a monsoon or something. Uh, this is the large scale stuff, and these are the small scale things. There's actually a lot more of these that go into each one of these, but this is just four of them. And a lot, a lot more of these, a lot more locations. But, but you can see, right, multiple scale stuff. These are high, high frequency things interacting to give you this low frequency thing, which then gets transformed into an output. Okay. So that's our simulation. And so we're going to use only the output for the Zs there, the last stage for input. So we won't, when we run through this in our model, we won't have any knowledge of the actual underlying Lorenz system. Right? That's, that's unknown to us. Um, we have, we'll use a three period ahead lead time. Um, we'll choose the parameters, again, through genetic algorithm, the hyperparameters of this model. 
Um, we have three embeddings that were chosen. And so basically we have 75 periods held out for prediction. And we're gonna consider um, these Bayesian deep ensemble models for, uh, I mean, uh, up to two to eight layers in this context. So this is a realization. This is showing the seven layer model results here. And uh, the black is the truth, and then red is the, the posterior mean in this context. And you can't probably see it very well, but this light shaded area is the uncertainty bounds there. Um, and it, and it does pretty well. The out of, this is all out of sample, and the out of sample prediction coverage is, is uh, nominally 96%, which you could tweak that. If we made this even more chaotic, we're not going to do that well. But in this kind of quasi nonlinear, I mean, it's nonlinear, but um, not super nonlinear, uh, we get results somewhere nominally around the 95% level. Are you doing some embedding? Yeah, there's, there's three levels of embedding on the input here. Yeah. So, so the real world example, uh, I don't know if that movie is actually gonna work here. Um, I don't know how to make it work. Oh, I don't, uh, oh well, oh well. I, it would just show you sea surface temperature moving at a different scale than soil moisture. Uh, so pretend like that's happening. Um, and it, oh yeah, that's true. Um, All right, and it may or may not move. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not that good of a video anyway, so we're not really missing out too much. Do we? So it, it looks like the soil moisture is moving slower because of this, the frame rate, but, but look at the patterns, and the patterns, um, actually the sea surface, the soil moisture is moving, is changing much more rapidly than the sea surface temperature patterns, the overall big patterns, which is sort of the point. Um, and, and so the question is, are you, are you able to really actually gain any information from, from this region predicting, say, this region? Okay. Oh, uh, it's a product, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know of any, any real gridded soil moisture data that's not somehow or another assimilated. Maybe, maybe there are some, but this is actually, uh, I think a NOAA assimilation going back to 48, so it's very model related. Yeah. Uh, red, I think. <laughs> yeah. No, blue. Blue is sorry. Blue. Blue is wetter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, now that you pointed that out, I'm going to be embarrassed because I think we flipped it around in the other one. Yeah, it depends on the time, though. It could be drier than normal. Um, it's an anomaly. I think I, I, I hung it up here. Okay. Oh, wow. Well. Okay. So, so this is too... Well, we're interested in predicting this at, in May because May is the most crucial time, um, arguably, uh, for corn production in the U.S. because that's the planting time. And so if you can't get in the field, it's going to be a problem. And so if you're going to know, farmers are very interested, producers are very interested in knowing, you know, kind of what to expect next year. And, and so you get these. I know a producers or uh, Climate Prediction Center in the U.S. produces these forecasts, but not at this resolution, okay? Um, certainly in time and space. So we want it, we predicted in May. And, and so this is the, the ob observed from, from, the, from the model out of sample. And these are, these are predictions, and, and pretty, pretty typical of what we see. You know, again, it's hard to, pre to predict soil moisture, particularly with just SST. Uh, and so if you can do even this good a prediction, it's, it's sort of better than average, for sure. Um, and we get uncertainty quantification there as well. Um, what I wanted, this is, what this is showing is, you could say, which, you gotta, there's, I don't know, maybe, a thousand, thousands, I'd have to think about it, thousands of potential predictors here, maybe tens of thousands. And so there's all those betas there that, that are shrunk, most of them are shrunk to zero through the stochastic search. But there's a few that, that get chosen a lot. Like this one gets chosen, that pattern got chosen a lot. Every single time through the Bayesian iteration, that one got chosen. Uh, and, and so these, these are the ones, uh, the six highest ones that are influencing the first EOF of soil moisture for the predictor. And my point of showing you this is 
is that you can see some structure, some difference in the structure and difference in the time scale of what's going on, which is the point, right? We needed to be able to come up with predictors that were multiple scale and that could interact uh, to give us that prediction. And, and so this is what it, it was selecting. It was selecting the stuff that we hoped it would select in that regard. Now, can you really say what this is? No. But you could say there's something happening at that scale that, that's probably important. Okay. And this is just kind of showing overall comparisons. And, and I've, uh, this table has some models I didn't show you, like the um, bootstrap version of this model versus the Bayesian model. And the bootstrap model actually does slightly better in terms of the mean square prediction error and a little bit better in terms of, of the number of times that the skill score was better than climatology, um, which is only about 60%, by the way, which isn't awesome. Um, but it, it's regionally dependent. But the point here is that the, um, the Bayesian model by far did the best in terms of uncertainty quantification, getting the distributional properties of the forecast right, which I think is, if you're going to do this kind of long lead forecast, you better have an idea of your certainty of, of your prediction. Okay. Um, so just to, to recap that, what are we doing? Uh, we're just really doing uh, regularized space-time regression. Right? That's it. Simple, simple as it gets. Um, the inputs that we have, our predictors, are stochastically and dynamically transformed used in, in this nonlinear way, which is, which is crucial. Um, and, and, and so it's important to recognize, if you know me, I'm all about dynamics, but there's no dynamics in my prediction model except in the transformation of my predictors. So it's a different way to use dynamics in this context. So the model itself is just a regression. What makes it dynamic is how we transform the predictors. And then there's multiple levels of transformation, which is important, that's why it's a deep model. Give us different scales. And then there's multiple copies of that because we need the reproducibility. We need to select from a, a broad enough group that, that we're slowly learning what's going on or we're going to overpredict, which is typical of machine learning models. So very easy to implement. Um, if you didn't want to do the Bayesian version, you did a regular version of this, you know, I guarantee you that the deep ESN model is super easy to, to program if you just draw random variables, basically, in a loop. Um, and then, uh, so, so very fast to do this because of the ESN structure. Uh, there's a couple conclusion slides, but basically, uh, I'm not going to read through this, but just tell you that, you know, you could do all of this stuff from either perspective. You could take a pure stat model, you could do a pure machine learning model, but the, the question is, can we, do, can we do some hybrid things that happen faster that get us sort of in the same ballpark, if not better? And I mean, that's what we're exploring. Um, have we really done much? No, I mean, we just took some obvious things and, and, and mashed them together. Um, but I'm pretty excited about it, to be honest. I mean, we've, we've put fully Bayesian versions of every one of these models, and, and they're terrible. I mean, they work really well, but they're terrible to do. You know, you just don't want to go there. Um, what you, I would much rather do is explore why these um, echo state things work when we're just randomly picking parameters and exploit that more in, in my own modeling. Okay. So that's, that's it. Um, the last thing I'll say is that there's a plug here, and I'm only plugging this because it's free, or will be. Um, we have a book, Noel and Andrew Zamet Manon and I have a, a new book coming out that's R-based stuff for spatial temporal statistics. Um, free to download PDF. Um, it's going to be done next week if I get back and put the last changes in, last edits in. So, um, and if you can't find it, shoot me an email, happy to send it to you. Um, again, our point is we're not making money on this, we just want people to start doing space-time stuff with R. All right, thank you for the attention, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chris, for this very exciting talk. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions from the audience. Thanks very much, Chris. I, I mean, this is fantastic. Um, I mean, from speaking from the stats side, I was wondering if you've had interaction a lot with computer scientists and how they are responding to your work? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I, the, the non-deep version of this, I gave a talk um, 
at uh, CSIRO in, in Australia and with a big com combined machine learning stat group. And the machine learners were way more interested in this than the uh, stat people were. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is pretty typical because they're sort of, sort of the issue about you know, how we're going to survive in a machine learning world now in data science. Um, and they're early adopters, quick adopters, and they will take anything they can and use it and put it in a NIPS proceeding and move on. And, and we're waiting two years to get something published. So they, they're interested in, yeah, for sure. And they don't do a lot of space-time stuff. There are some examples of convolutional neural networks tied to recurrent neural networks, but they're clunky, right? You gotta have a million images, sequences of images to make those work, or you don't here, right? These are all low-dimensional. I mean, that's, this would never work if I tried to fit a big combined convolutional deep neural network because we don't have the data for that in this example. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. More questions? This is just a comment, Chris. Uh, it's actually uh, the famous Gauss at the time when he invented the method of least squares. The astronomers were doing all these complicated models and they were unable to give a decent prediction for the return of the star, this particular star. And he using least squares method that he invented with observation in a simple way and was able to predict it perfectly well. It arrived in the same, in the same time. And this gets us into the picture that you, you are showing. Your prediction is outside of all the ranges of the model that you were giving, mm. and you thought it was wrong. And I think this gets us into this particular issue of parsimony in the sense of the simplicity of dealing with the, with the problem in this way. So what you have there is your weight matrix, and all what you are doing is looking for the largest eigenvalue and taking the ratio of the two, and you are able to process large number of data. So I thank you. It's really quite interesting, but I just want to get this prospect. Yeah. Was in history of science, stuff like that have taken a place. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's kind of the other connection. I thought you were also going to say that at the end of the day, we're just doing regression. You know, like we always do. Yeah. <laughs> but, this, but this is what least the squares is. We yeah, yeah like, absolutely. 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 Yeah, I agree. I, As I think you're well aware, there's a lot of money being put into decadal forecasting. Do you see a role in that? Yeah, yeah you know, it's, a good, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, have you seen much decadal forecasting from a stat perspective is an a, a interesting question. So personally, what I think you could do is I think you could use your, your um, deterministic models as inputs, right? I mean... So I think there's a, yeah, I think, I, I think that would be really good. So it's all about the input. And I think there your input would be perfect in this setting. Uh, so you could, and you could get uncertainty quantification, which you can't do very easily in that con traditional context without emulation, yeah. It just, if, if you look at the latest release from the WMO, the meteorological agencies, there's a lot of money going that way. So I think for the community, it might be interesting to be aware of that. And I think statistics could play a real role with these yeah. types of models. Yeah. yeah, I'm always happy to get money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, well, we are... We need to be closing now because we are uh, going to our tours. We really want to thank you again, thank you. Chris, uh, Chris sorry, for this exciting talk. And then we want to um, uh, give you this thank you. little recognition for this presentation. So please uh, help me again to... Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll give you the best. Uh, okay. oh. <laughs>